Right. Good afternoon. Tudo bem? Eu sinto muito, mas não falo português. And I'm going to give this presentation in English. So I hope you can follow. I'll try to speak slowly, although I have uh, 200 slides, and I hope we will be here out of this room soon enough before you're asleep. So I'm going to talk to you about governance, governance in open source software. And the title says, Governance Makes the Difference in Open Source Software Innovation. We talk about innovation because open source software is not only about innovation, but uh, I think that we are now entering a phase where open source is becoming the preferred vehicle for innova technology innovation in, um, in the IT and specifically in software. So I'm going to talk about the, the context, the way we look at this, uh, this industry very quickly. Then I will share with you an analysis, a long view analysis, where we identify three stages in, uh, or three layers in the evolution of open source software since it started 30 years ago. Then we will concentrate on the stage that I think we are in at the moment, which is characterized by collaborative innovation. Then we will share some observation on current project, current collaborative project and open source project. And then we will move into why governance is important, where governance is applied, and how or what are the building blocks of uh, governance. So the context. First of all, we're going to talk about technology innovation. When we use the word innovation, we often use it in the way where we talk about new business models or new innovations and new company, etc. But new innovations of usage, like the one you see on the right, of the screen is always the result of some upstream innovation in technology. And this is the kind of innovation we're going to talk about. In the context of open source software, it means that we're going to talk in the context of something that is growing fast. We all have our own figures on what the size or the growth rate of the open source market is. And I'm sharing these from a European perspective. But those are the quantitative figures, uh, say, for Europe. But I'd like to match this growth with uh, my three layers that appear. And uh, that's the long view I want to share with you, where we started with one layer, then something else came adding and making the open source environment and the open source industry more uh, complex, and now we have we are this third layer where we have today um, the components of what the open source industry is going to be like tomorrow, and where, for instance, you guys will have to um, invest your own efforts. So let's look at the first layer, the first stage, and this first stage is something that has uh, that I call free software by developers. And of course, it all started like 30 years ago, when, or most, more than 30 years ago, when Richard Stallman sent that mail saying, hey guys, I'm going to write a new operating system called GNU, it's not Unix, etc., etc. you know that, and the rest is history. And it all started with these four freedoms that defined what we are today. The first one being the right to run the software for whatever we want to do, the second, to read the software. I'm going to go fast here because I know you all know about them by heart, but I'd like to start all my presentation by reminding them. So the second freedom is to read the software. The third one is to redistribute it, to share it, like you would share a good book or a good uh, cooking recipe with somebody else. 
And the fourth freedom is the freedom to improve this uh, software and to share some of the modified versions of this software. And these four simple freedoms have had the power to change the software industry. And without them, we wouldn't be here today. So we owe them a lot. And that's what I call here, that's why I call these software by developers, because these four freedoms, they are there to empower developers, to make them aware, to make them uh, able to control the, the tools they use, and to make them better. This stage, this layer, gave us some of the best open source projects. The Apache web server, the, um, um, I mean, you, see, you have them there. Even Android is part of this, Debian, all in those open source uh, uh, operating systems uh, come from that. Uh, today we have something even recent, which is called like VLC. You know, you probably know that. That, and I would uh, like to put LibreOffice in this category, a category that is driven and carried out by communities and by developers. But uh, oh, and I forgot. And this stage also gave us all those wonderful licenses that we all struggle to use and that uh, defines the roots of the games in open source software and in the industry and the open source initiative who's uh, um, steering and managing all these licenses belongs, I would say, to that layer. The second layer is something that appeared towards uh, in the second half of the 90s, which are called open source by entrepreneurs. And here, of course, we had a lot of ironies, like all these people, and still today you hear those conventional managers and people who pretend to know better saying, well, how do you make money with free software? And I'm not in the charity business. I'm not here to play with this and that, thinking that open source is not serious. But open source is not serious, and with that, what happened is that free software with some special or, or, I don't know, if through some dubious uh, circuits, became commercial open source. I know there is a lot of debate between the opposition, between open source and uh, free software, but bear with me and let's accept that commercial open source is something that today is uh, to be recon recognized with. And what happened in the 90s and the early uh, 2000s is that at the time, all the product categories that you can find in the information system stack of any companies and large companies that have been created, invested, defined by the proprietary vendors, well, they've all become challenged by open source um, competition, by open source competitors, by open source alternatives. And some of the Main companies, because of this competition, even, uh, have even disappeared. Uh, in the early 90, uh, 90s, yes, companies like Vignette or Documentum were the darlings of uh, the stock exchange in uh, enterprise content management, for instance, and they've disappeared. Many companies have had their fate decided by st um, their stockholders saying, okay, now there is... Uh, the future belongs to open source companies. I want to sell my shares. And this is how Oracle acquired many companies like PeopleSoft, Siebel, etc. Because they were challenged by open source competitors. So that did change the software industry. And it did change the software industry because there is a, work, uh, um, a business model that works. The famous business model that people think about or try to look for, but it's not that difficult. It's based on the trilogy of selling additional products, selling services to support that, and, this. and a third one that is probably less obvious and that I call the insurance business model, selling the subscriptions, accompanying the user uh, along the life cycle, I mean the the lifetime of uh, the ownership of this software. And you can 
agree with me that the insurance business model is not such a bad business model. And that's how I can explain that so many companies have thrived. And what happened is that we've had a bonanza of startups, an explosion, an explosion of startups appearing in the market, redefining the software industry, and opening up lots of opportunities for developers like you, uh, lots of uh, opportunities and challenges for users who had to contend with this uh, new offering, sometimes not being very reassured because many of those companies are still small companies. The leader of those is Red Hat. And how many, how many employees in Red Hat? Between five and 10,000? How many employees in companies like Microsoft, Oracle, IBM, etc. So this is small, but yet very powerful. And so powerful that even the large companies have had to pay attention. What are all these companies in common? They're all leaders in the, in the industry, global leaders. They are not at all identified by, uh, with the open source software. And yet, all these companies have spent millions and millions of dollars investing in open source software. Paying people to develop software. Paying people full time to contribute to open source software. Must be that open source software is something strategic. And even the one, you see this logo at the top right of the, the slide, is not particularly identified with open source. And yet, one of the employees of this company is the president of the Apache Software Foundation, meaning they have to pay attention to that. So this is open source software by entrepreneurs. And that's the second, I would say, second layer, the one that uh, emerged at the end of the 90s and that we have now we're not working with. But now I'd like to attract your attention to a new layer that emerged over the last uh, five years, I would say, and that I would like to call open source by committees. It's open source that powers innovation that is carried out by ecosystems, not just by one company, because so, so, so far we've been talking about companies individually, but now we're talking about companies working together. And that changes the whole uh, dynamic of the industry. Now that happened in around 2010, because in 2010 something really exploded, which was in a way not so anticipated by the leaders, and it's what we know as cloud computing. For some time we've heard about cloud computing, virtualization, etc., and, and people were saying, oh yes, another marketing fad, another something that will fade away. But then, no, cloud computing is becoming what we have, uh, we were calling for a while, uh, computing on demand. And, um, and all the big leaders, some new leaders have emerged and have completely emerged in that. But cloud computing comes with a level, a certain level of complexity. You remember that vision of cloud computing in 2009 said, oh, it's uh, yes, pass, SAS, oh, that's how we get to grasp, oh, com cloud computing. And then a couple of years, the year after, the NIST came out with this model, which is, was a little bit more complex, identifying building blocks and roles and features and functions and uh, requirements and constraints in cloud computing. Then gradually some researchers, and that's one from the uh, university in Holland, came up with another model yet a little bit more complicated, uh, complex, and not one person can actually produce one application that can cover all this. And we at uh, uh, W2, we worked with uh, one of the a model like this, we're trying to simplify the other one and uh, we identify all sorts of functionality. We have like the functional framework. So it's very complicated now. Plus, it's not going to be more simp simple because now we will, we're moving towards Internet of Things that will run on cloud computing. 
An Internet of Things is some, a place where we'll have all devices connected to the network. We will have applications interconnected with each other because that's how we build applications today. And eventually we'll have applications from sectors of industry talking to each other whole. This is what we call the digital revolution where we have systems of systems and this is so complicated that not one company, of course, and even less one individual, can actually embrace all this and contribute and make an effort, uh, a contribution to that. So what ha what's happening now, the change that is happening, is that these big leaders, these global leaders, those that define and create the applications we all use or try not to use, but we can't escape them really, they have had the whole in business built and running on open source software. They've been using open source. They've been consuming open source. But then they realized that at some point that they were making the whole, the pond dry. So they had to contribute back at some point. And these technologies that they were developing and using, developing by using open source, at some point something happened gradually. These companies that are not at all identified with open source and are way, way, uh, away from the ethical of the four freedoms that I was mentioning earlier on, they started contributing their own technologies, like open compute from Facebook, like, um, I mean, all these technologies, uh, Android by Google, etc., Hadoop from Yahoo, and even in China, there are now, there are, they've been trying to develop everything by hiding and having, going very proprietary way, and now they're discovering that going the open source way is, the only way they can uh, survive, the only way they can keep this technology alive. Because, in fact, these technologies that they are developing will only survive if they're used by other people, so they have to share them. And the KPIs, or the key performance indicators for these technologies, is not so much whether they make a lot of money. It's more that whether they are used by other people and become a standard. Because if they use and become a standard, then people will be trained to use them. And then employment, they will be able to find peop new peop people to work on them and they can carry on with their businesses. And this is how we moved from a, a, a phase where these global leaders were using open source, consuming open source, taking advantage of it, and now contributing back. And that's the only way it works. And these guys do that because they have a long-term vision I mean, they really are the top of the, the, the mountain and they see very far away and they understand that there is no other way to survive in the future and to be a player in the future. So this is how we now move, uh, uh, having all these technologies that are not developed by one company, but by ecosystems, by several companies, an ecosystem of companies. And that's a new dimension, a new way. And that's what I call open source by committees. Because in that case, com open source is totally in the control of com committees, of uh, executives that are sent to meetings, that decide, etc. So I don't know in terms of efficiency or entropy how, how it works, but um, well, I know a bit how it works. But this is something we have to to think about and go by. And these things are representing are representing projects that are all over the world. So that's why we call collaborative innovation now. And open source has become the key vehicle, the vehicle that drives or that enables, at least enables, this collaborative innovation. These companies with open source software don't have to cooperate on the basis of complex contracts signed by lawyers that cost a fortune and with some liabilities uh, that can uh, um, come after that. No, they just have to work with open source software. And the beauty of these four freedoms is, uh, and the licenses is that the license attached to a file, to a code, explains the rules of the game, explains what you can do with the code. So you don't need any contract. And that's how open source is enabling this uh, cooperation between companies, companies that can even be competitors. And there are many projects. So a few examples. Hadoop is an ecosystem with complex architecture and many companies. Another one, Genevieve. Genevieve is internet in the cars uh, that 
is a complex architecture again with companies from different origins, the car manufacturers and the IT companies. Open daylight for software defining, defined network. That was a reaction of companies seeing that the new technology was uh, uh, happening and they, they really want to try to, say, they say, hey, let's wake up, let's do something, let's do something together, let's find the standards. Something happened in the, in the last couple of weeks, I didn't have time to do the slides, but you've all heard of Docker. Docker is like a technology that was developing at this, and now we have an organization that is being created, a multi-company organization, and they are currently writing the bylaws, uh, to, to the rules of how they're going to operate, to look after the Docker and evolve the standard and the applications. Polarsys, it's another one for embedded systems in the aerospace. OpenStack. OpenStack is a typical example of uh, collab collaboration. It, of course, it, it did appear as a reaction from uh, the, the domination of the cloud industry by Amazon, and it was driven by Rackspace at the beginning. But now it became a full-fledged uh, multi-project uh, with uh, many companies. And we have open cloudware. Open cloudware is an environment to manage the life cycle of an application over, uh, na natively over the cloud. That's something we do with uh, OW2 and a bunch of companies. So you always have like 10, 15 companies working together on this uh, collaborative uh, development. And one thing that we've observed is many of them do this under the umbrella of third party neutral open source organizations. It's not one company that say, hey, let's work, I'm going to decide everything, I'm going to drive everything. No, let's put everything within the, under the control of an open source organization. A neutral ground where everything will run, where everything will be decided, and where no one will uh, take advantage um, over the other, the, the other participants. That's a, very, that's a key observation here. And I have another, a few observations, more observations about real projects. When you look at these projects now, what you see that, first of all, these big projects don't come up with market-ready solutions. They innovate, they deliver proof of concepts, they deliver some code, they deliver some uh, use cases, some um, uh, demonstrations, but then it's not exactly what the market wants. What mainstream systems integrators and mainstream users want is something that is market ready, something that comes with a price list, support contracts, uh, proper packaging, uh, proper roadmap, uh, proper uh, uh, existing early adopters that we can know, uh, some contracts, some training programs, etc. A whole uh, set of things that are not code, and, but that makes this project, this code, acceptable, I would say, comestible by the, by the market. And what the market expects is something that is much more than code, and the, diff the gap between this and that is what I call the delivery challenge. It's something that needs to be um, addressed by, by project leaders, and to develop all this, you require some, some sort of organization. Plus, talking about open source software, there are some specifics, given what is the size of the community, uh, in terms of sustainability, is it uh, long term, or in terms of critical mass. So if I look at other projects, there's another observation, looking at projects, whether they are market ready, and whether they're big or not, I have this very simple, it's, uh, but it's just to give you the, an idea of uh, what we can uh, decide or uh, derive from, from that. I've laid here some project according to their sizes and my uh, personal um, estimation of whether they are ready for market or not. And uh, when you look at what characterizes them is that those that are not ready for market have very weak community support and very weak corporate support. That no companies there. And those that are ready, you see that they are a commu com they're supported by the community. They are, um, uh, they, there are companies that have invested, invested resources behind there, and they 
therefore are able to deliver industry-grade distributions. So that makes me think of a couple of things that we would need to take into consideration. The first one is that code is only a, fract code, uh, a fraction of the software value chain that uh, delivers ready, market-ready offerings. You need packaging, et cetera, et cetera. I've covered this already. The second observation is that successful open source projects are indeed supported by IT companies. I did mention LibreOffice as one of those examples of uh, a project being driven by developers. But in fact, the bulk of the software is provided by six companies, by developers being paid by six companies. So a software that has no corporate support has very little chance to succeed. At some point, it's a big debate whether we have to pay for code or not, or whether we have to expect that the communities, the free communities, will uh, genuinely and organically create a wonderful software. Yes, they want, they're willing to create this wonderful software. But the breakthrough can only come if at some point large companies invest behind the software. And these large companies can be big private companies, but it, you can also have government or government creating business opportunities that will make worth uh, for companies to invest in the software. So there's a whole uh, e economic model that uh, explains why some software and some open source software are um, um, successful or not. And the last one, and that's all very much interlinked, is that those successful projects, they do implement a flawless uh, governance. It's a governance that is transparent, that we can see, that contributes to make this project trustworthy, that attracts contributors. I mean, contributors will not contribute or spend time on a project that they, th they fear might be repropriatized by a private company. If you remember, you remember Symbian. Symbian was an operating system for mobile devices that was controlled by Nokia. And for some reason, Nokia had a change in strategy, and Symbian, which was an open source operating systems, system, was repropriatized and just disappeared from my radar. Because private companies can change strategies. And these are the things that we have to look at. So a, an open source governance is something that maintains the independence of the project and guarantees the long-term sustainability of the project. So let's have a look at what happens out there. I've given you some examples of uh, big collaborative projects. And now we have the governance in, uh, um, by the communities. And if you go to the websites of those communities, you will see that each of them has a page where they um, identify what is their governance. Apache has a governance page. Eclipse has a governance page. It's not the same as Apache. Apache is being an organization of individuals, is run in a certain way, whereas Eclipse is more an organization of uh, companies and has another way, runs a different way. Apache is a community of communities host, hosting many different projects. Eclipse uh, organizes different projects around one uh, platform, the Eclipse platform, and their plugin architecture. Therefore, the conditions being different, the governance is a little bit different. But it exists, and it's very important because it helps them each year, year after year, progress and maintain what they're offering. OpenStack is a, is a case that is interesting. OpenStack started as a project driven by a company called Rackspace. And as the project grew and attracted more and more interest, 
uh, there's been discussions, and I remember being part of in some of the Open Stack Summit of these discussions, where they said, okay, well, now we're growing. If we want to spend money, we need to have a foundation, the word foundation. And then what happened is that OpenStack being big enough, they've managed to create their own foundation. Just like LibreOffice. LibreOffice is big enough and they've created their own foundation. So it's a case where a project is identified with its own foundation. In the case of LibreOffice, the foundation uh, um, also organizes how the, the project is, uh, ev evolves, the roadmap, uh, runs the, the releases, same case for OpenStack, and also the foundation is specifically there to protect the IP and to protect the, uh, uh, the rights of, uh, of the project. Linux Foundation is another case that is interesting. They have their own governance, of course, because they look after the Linux operating systems, but they are uh, the open source um, organization that serves as a home for other projects. Xen, you know, you all know Xen. Xen is a project that is in fact supported by, owned, you can say by Citrix, Citrix being a private company. But you remember what I said about Nokia and Symbian. So Citrix, to avoid that, that fate or to create trust, I had the very good idea to uh, move Citrix within the umbrella and the governance of the Linux Foundation. And Citrix has become a collaborative project inside the Linux Foundation with its own governance page. Same thing for Open Daylight. Open Daylight is a whole organization, a foundation, if you like, or sub-foundation, or pseudo-foundation that is being created inside the Linux Foundation. I've mentioned Docker, and I forget the name of the organization, maybe it's Open Docker or something like that. And this is being created the same way, inside uh, the Linux Foundation. So there is like a hierarchy of governance, governance of rules, and they can, by doing this, avoid to reinvent the wheel, benefit from the experience of the Linux Foundation, and by working together, they create the critical mass that will make them credible on the market. It takes some time, but that's how the governance is really helping projects grow, exist, and being, um, being big real players on the market. And of course, at W2, we have our own governance. We are also a community of communities. We host 100 projects, and each project has its own governance, and uh, we have our own uh, our way to make decisions. So what, what is, when I talk about governance, what, what is it? What do we have in mind? So I want to finish by sharing with you some uh, components, elements, building blocks uh, of, of governance. And that is, there are things that if you are project leaders, a project leader or, or in an association, things that are very important. First of all, anybody can create an open source project. Anybody. There are nearly six million of those projects on GitHub, hundreds of thousands on SourceForge, uh, OpenUp identifies close to 700,000. So an open source project is really nothing. It's not something that will magically grow because you put it on open source somewhere and suddenly 2,000 developers will fight to have the privilege to contribute to your software. That doesn't exist like, like that. You have to give some guarantees. And this is why I'm not really happy when I hear people saying, oh, I'm on it's open source, yes, yes, it's on GitHub. Yes, but there is a big difference, especially when you look at the numbers, between those projects that are on the repositories and those projects that are co-opted, hosted, managed, supported by open source um, organizations such as the Eclipse, you see oh, Eclipse has 400 projects, Apache 250, and yet they've, they've grown up recently because they've uh, opened up, this, compared to the, uh, the figures you see above, it's nothing. At OW2 we have 100, OpenStack 20. And why? And because it's much more selective. 
But that gives the prey some credibility. Another point I'd like to, to, um, to highlight here is that having an open source license is not proof of having governance. Again, when I hear, oh, yes, it's on GitHub, oh, and it's in the uh, um, uh, APL, BSD, GPL. Yes, but of course, a license, but a license is what? It's the legal framework that tells you what you can do or not with the, with the project. But the governance is something else. So what the, a, a project with no governance looks like is what that messy illustration you see at the top, no license, no governance. If you just add the license, okay, your project is clear and you know what you can do and people know what they can do with it, providing you, you render you licenses properly because some project can have 50 licenses all mixed up in different files. But then the project with the governance is something that looks much, much um, cleaner. It's something that is clean on the outside and clean on the inside and something we want to contribute to something that a user can look at, can understand, and can trust. Another thing we have to keep in mind is that community governance and project governance are something a bit different. Community governance are big decision-making processes, whereas community a project governance is a way to how you um, manage contributions, how you manage the blogs, how you manage the releases, and some of the uh, decision points might not be uh, uh, dependent on the, on the same, I would say, on the same decision level. So I cannot elaborate on this, but there is like sometimes a, an overlap or uh, an interaction between the project governance itself and the community governance. But just keep in mind this distinction. When governance is needed, uh, I came across a nice page from this book, The Art of Community by John O'Bacon. The book is probably four uh, year old now, it's, you can download it um, uh, on the internet. And he identifies that there is a need for governance the moment the size of the community becomes uh, significant when, or when you s realize that your project is becoming uh, so important or you, you, can, you start having conflicts. To have conflicts is not necessarily a bad thing. It means that people are interested, they have uh, an interest and they want the project, they, want, they have the idea with the project. So if you have the governance, you can really regulate this and find the right decision processes to, uh, to make sure that the pro project goes through crisis periods. When you need expensive res extensive resources, think of a project that needs uh, a huge hosting basis or it's um, 10 minutes, thank you. You think of um, a project that uh, requires lots of uh, resources, you need to have uh, a support, you need to have su subsidies, you need to address uh, maybe governments. So at this point, you need to, to have uh, your house really in order and be able to explain how, how your thing is going to run and this is where you need the governance. Or specifically when you, have, uh, you start uh, getting some commercial interest and that's a very good news, but then for this commercial interest to grow and more customers to be interested in the project and more customers being uh, feeling comfortable to download and implement and deploy the, your code. Uh, a good governance, good clean governance is something that is, uh, that is really uh, absolutely necessary. Talking about governance, there are different governance styles. We talk about the benevolent dictator uh, and that was the Linus Torvald uh, definition of uh, governance. Uh, the Apache Foundation typically being uh, an organization of individuals is based on what we call meritocracy. These are uh, cooptation of developers uh, by other developers, so the, the most uh, uh, efficient or uh, prolific uh, or those that contribute, to the, provide the best contributions get to uh, have more recognition. Um, Democracy is probably another one that uh, is more char uh, characteristic of these organizations that are organizations of organizations, where different companies get together and want to decide, so they want to have each one a vote and they want to make sure that uh, things can be decided and they can have a say in the, in the decision process. Uh, and that's typically the case of uh, OpenStack, uh, and this, the one you see there at the bottom, or OW2 and Eclipse. And then you also have the commercial, commercial governance. Commercial governance is the governance of those projects that are so-called free communities, but that are in fact controlled by a private company. 
a private company that decides and up to a certain extent give, uh, give back the power to the community or keep some control, some control on it. So some of the major projects on, on the market are in fact controlled by a, a commercial company behind and uh, so you have to look at the way they control that. At the W2, we have, and I'm finishing, we have a number of, um, we have our governance, and we identify, at the background of the governance, we identify, for instance, what uh, the stages for building a community. Things we identify as the technical stage, the open source stage, or the ecosystem stage. The technical stage is a stage where you define the project and you are really make sure that the code is properly manage documentation is properly uh, is where 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 we can find it properly etc cetera, etc cetera. the open source stage is something a little bit different it's uh, it's a stage where you actually make sure that the rules the four freedoms are really in place and operational it's the the stage where you decide to join a community uh, or or create your own foundation it's the stage where you decide whether you want the contributors to sign a contributor uh, license agreement or not, how, how you want to run this. It's maybe the stage where you decide which kind of license you're going to, uh, to implement or kind of uh, cocktail of licenses you can afford. And then the ecosystem stage is a stage where you are ready or for uh, uh, outreaching to the market and uh, develop some uh, uh, some productization, uh, etc. And, and there, the, the, the efforts or the focus can be can evolve a little bit on, from infrastructure to uh, to the governance precisely, and maybe ultimately to more marketing. That's just a framework we have in mind. Another uh, one, uh, another idea is that uh, some governance building blocks. Uh, typically, we have a board of directors, and we have a technology council. The board of directors makes some kind of decisions and the technology council make other, makes other decisions or recommendations. And in fact, we've decided that the technology council does not make decisions. The technology council can only provide guidance and the decisions are made by the management office or by the board of directors. And these are different things that you learn. You learn to fine tune this. You cannot create a, 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 an open source foundation just from scratch like that. There are lots of uh, recipes, in fact, it's, uh, uh, that you learn, things you learn or traps uh, you learn uh, as you go. The learning curve is quite long. And you need to juggle with bylaws, with uh, some key principles, with some of the roles in the, in the, in the organization, with the, what are the entities, what's the structure to make the decisions, uh, uh, what are the thresholds where you need to make a decision or not, and solve the conflicts, what are the procedures that are in place, etc. So though this is a lot of things that are needed, but this is these are the, the nuts and bolts of uh, running a community and it's something that cannot really be improvised and that's why some of the most of the communities are run by professional people that are employed full time another uh, framework we have in mind is uh, for ip and licensing we understand that we run we develop some code that can run on an execution platform that can use some tools and that can enable some applications so how do we What's the scope of our licensing thinking? Do we, do we expect that the code runs only on open source platforms or software, or we can only use open source tools, etc.? Sometimes you, you need to find that. So there, these are, that's what we call the technical licensing framework. And another shopping list here are the project management best practices. That's something we are developing in the framework of a project that we are presenting on the booth here, which is the App Hub um, project. It's a marketplace we are defining, and we have, in part of our governance, we are defining that only those projects that implement the best practices that we are listing here will make it to the marketplace. We cannot afford to showcase projects that uh, are not able or not, um, uh, that don't offer all the guarantees. So here you have like 10, 12 of those things of big practices. And that covers how you manage the commits and bug reports to how you plan the project, how you handle the, the, the contributors, how you run the documentation, etc. And all these are different areas that can be enforced or not by the governance. For instance, the OpenStack Foundation has recently um, decided that the testing procedures will be enforced to all the projects to be part of the release. They are now in the kilo release, 
and all the, the software that is part of this release have to undergo extensive testing procedures. You could say this is best practice, but what they've done, they've included that in the governance. And this is the kind of governance, the decisions could, that could not be made if there was not a, governance, a framework for, for proper governance that uh, enable the OpenStack um, release, for instance, to be more credible, more, uh, more sa safer for, for users and to be more successful in the market. So to finish, um, what we said, that governance is something that helps um, project uh, success, succeed and it covers the technical, the uh, legal, community management and we can see best practices in, in general. So we, we think that a proper governance is the best way to improve the market readiness of a project, to make the project easy to contribute to, to make the project more uh, trustworthy and, uh, and the community more sustainable. So this is down to finish on why governance make the difference. It's because open source today is a driver of open source organizations. We have, we, re we recognize that uh, no com a, uh, a repository is not a community. Um, a license is not governance. And again, the key sentence here is that governance helps project grow by making them easy to contribute to. Thank you. Do we have five minutes for questions or not? Actually, no. Actually, no. Actually we have no, no five minutes for questions, so we can discuss at the bar or whatever you like. Oh, the next has not arrived yet? Yeah, you do. One, just like one or two questions at all. I guess it's fine. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, O próximo palestrante não chegou, então se vocês tivessem uma ou duas perguntas muito rápidas, eu acho que ele acabou de chegar. <risos> Perdão. Você é o próximo palestrante? Então você está certo, você está certo. Então, eu vou falar.